dark skies over the Pacific in late 1943 set the scene. U.S. Navy radar operators guiding evening patrols, pilots hunched in cramped cockpits, and Japanese torpedo bombers probing task forces under cover of night. In a terrifying first for carrier warfare, a small, fat team experiment launched from the carrier Enterprise on the night of Thursday, November 26, 1943, paired one torpedo bomber with radar to two Hellcats to intercept nocturnal attackers, a daring attempt that cost Medal of Honor Ace Edward Butch O'Hare his life but began U.S. Navy night fighter operations at sea and hinted at a hidden solution to Japan's night raids that would soon close the curtain on their advantage. You will see why this secretive improvised method mattered so much because it unlocked a new way to fight after dark while the Hellcat tightened the noose by day. Why did the United States Navy need a new carrier monster at all? And how could one airplane end Japan's early war dominance built on the Mitsubishi A6M0's amazing reach and agility? In early World War II, the Zero stunned Allied pilots with a phenomenal combat range and nimble handling, achieving very high victory ratios in 1940-90 even as its straight-line speed was modest, roughly 317 to roughly 332 miles per hour at about 16,000 feet, with a seldom-used emergency boost pushing near 345 miles per hour for short bursts, a dangerous setting that could ruin an engine if used too long. The Zero's long legs and turn performance were the secret at first, but its lack of self-sealing tanks and poor high-speed control response were weaknesses that American tacticians learned to probe. And you will soon hear how a quiet formation trick called the Thatch Weave began to claw back control before the Hellcat arrived to finish the job. Engineers at Grumman and combat pilots returned to the drawing board after the F-4U Corsair ran into early carrier landing troubles, and they focused on a fighter that was forgiving, sturdy, and simple to fly off a pitching deck while still being ferocious in a fight. The result was the Grumman F-6F Hellcat, powered by a Pratt and Whitney. R-2-800, double wasp radial engine of about 2,000 horsepower, or roughly 1,500 kilowatts, a power plant that designers harnessed with a broad wing, tough structure, and clear forward visibility to give naval aviators margin for error on takeoff and landing while keeping the punch needed to climb into combat and survive hits that would doom a lighter airframe. Let us explore how this machine was not just fast, about the high 300 miles per hour class at altitude, roughly 388 miles per hour, or about 625 kilometers per hour for the late F6F-5 variant, but also the most reliable and maintainable mount on the flight deck, which mattered more than any single top speed figure in the brutal arithmetic of carrier war. The hidden reason the Hellcat overturned Japan's edge was not one thing, but a blend. Survivability through armor and self-sealing tanks, stability as a gun platform, and six M2 Browning half-inch machine guns that poured heavy fire while pilots could still see their sight picture in the bouncing sea air. A balance of traits that worked under radar direction and mass formation control better than the faster but fussier options. The airplane's handling earned trust. Even the Navy's leading ace, David McCampbell, later said the Hellcat was outstanding, easy to fly, stable in gunnery, rugged and straightforward to maintain, points that sound simple but were the crucial secret that let thousands of carrier pilots fight day after day and come home to fight again tomorrow. In carrier air war, the most is won not by the hottest single duel, but by the best odds multiplied across countless sorties. The Hellcat was built for those odds. Before the Hellcat took center stage, tactics had to buy time, and the mystery of how to beat the Zero's turning circle demanded a chess move more than a drag race. John Jimmy Thatch worked out the Thatch Weave in 1942 as a two-ship crossing pattern that forced a pursuer to expose its belly to a wingman's guns, a method first tested in combat around Midway in early June 1942 and refined through hard fights near the Santa Cruz Islands and the long struggles over Guadalcanal. The weave did not make Wildcats or early fighters superior outright, but it broke the spell of the Zero's dogfight dominance and taught American pilots to work in pairs as a lethal system, a truth that would be magnified once Hellcats arrived with better climb, roll at speed, and durability. The Hellcats' combat debut in September 1943 marked a turning point that was less flashy than a single duel and more like a tide slowly rising until entire Japanese carrier air groups 
were swept away by 1944. Within months, massed Hellcat formations, guided by shipborne radar and controllers, began to cut into Japan's veteran corps, and as attrition mounted, fresh American pilots trained on standardized tactics fought increasingly inexperienced opponents, a grim but decisive shift in the Pacific air balance. You will see that this was not merely about a better airplane. It was a system of radar, training, logistics, and an airframe that could handle the grind. Data tells the story with unnerving clarity. U.S. Navy and Marine Hellcat pilots flew about 66,530 combat sorties and claimed roughly 5,163 aerial victories at a recorded cost of about 270 Hellcats lost in air-to-air -air combat, implying a claimed kill-to-loss ratio near 19 to 1, though like all wartime claims, overcounting existed and historians cautioned that the true ratio was lower. Even with that caveat, the weight of evidence shows the Hellcat as the dominant naval fighter of the last two years of the Pacific War, credited with a majority of U.S. Navy and Marine aerial victories and producing hundreds of aces, including the Navy's top ace, David McCampbell, with 34 victories, all in Hellcats. Production numbers and operational service confirm that dominance. More than 12,275 built in a little over two years, a pace that kept carriers stocked and ensured damaged aircraft could be replaced almost as fast as they were lost, with peak output roughly one airplane every hour. Why did Japanese cannon rounds that had once terrorized early war Allied fighters now so often fail to bring down the newer American machines? And how could the Zero's famed agility be blunted? The Hellcat structure and protection mattered here. Pilots reported the airplane could soak up hits that would have set a lighter airframe aflame, and once the fight moved into higher speeds, the Zero's heavy control forces and lack of boosted surfaces made it reluctant to roll or dive tightly. While the Hellcat retained control authority to change planes and angles quickly in the vertical, combat reports from tests against captured Zeros indicated that the Hellcat was faster at most altitudes and rolled better at higher speeds, while the Zero still outturned its opponent at low speeds a juxtaposition that encouraged Hellcat pilots to avoid flat-turn duels and instead fight with energy, climb, and coordinated pairs, another example of a hidden tactical truth behind the headline numbers. The Great Mariana's Turkey Shoot, the nickname that air crews gave the ferocious air battles of the Philippine Sea Campaign in June 1944, became the most famous Hall of Mirrors moment where radar pickets, discipline formations, and Hellcats met waves of incoming attackers and tore them apart before they could reach the fleet. On one climactic day, U.S. Navy fighter pilots shot down nearly 300 enemy aircraft, a slaughter not of luck but of training, vectoring, and the right airplane flown the right way. And after that battle, Japan's capacity to mount large coordinated carrier strikes was effectively broken. This was the visible consequence of many hidden advantages, logistics, pilot pipelines, shipboard radar, and above all, a fighter that could fight all day and still trap aboard safely in rough seas. Personal stories bring the machine into focus without glorifying the violence. David McCampbell's record in the Hellcat stands as a testament to the airplane's stability and firepower in steady hands, and Hamilton McWhorter became the Navy's first Hellcat ace, the first to reach five victories in the type, signaling to the fleet that the new fighter had arrived as an ace maker. On the other end, the night that Butch O'Hare did not return, the experiment that cost him his life also opened the path to routine night interceptions from carriers as radar-equipped Hellcats matured, a sobering reminder that innovation often comes at terrible personal cost, even as it saves others in the long run. You will remember these names because they reveal the human stakes behind the statistics. Technically, the Hellcats' performance profile tells a nuanced story rather than a single headline speed. Late production F6F-5. Aircraft commonly ran in the high 300 mile per hour class, about 388 miles per hour at around 25,000 feet, or roughly 625 kilometers per hour, and could climb briskly while carrying a robust load of fuel and ammunition for patrols that might range over hundreds of miles or hundreds of kilometers from their task forces. The standard armament of six half-inch guns, about 4,000 pounds or roughly 1,800 kilograms of ordnance options, and later the ability to carry rockets, gave the Hellcat a potent ground attack role in addition to air superiority. 
a versatility that proved decisive as island assaults demanded close air support minutes after airfields were suppressed. Range figures for specific mission profiles varied by load and throttle settings, but the Hellcat's patrol endurance worked well in the radar-directed defense rings the fast carriers increasingly relied upon in 1944 and 1945, a key reason controllers favored the type. Let us address the dark and deadly side of carrier aviation, a sobering truth often hidden beneath victory tallies. Operational losses, landing accidents, and training mishaps claimed far more Hellcats than air-to-air -air combat, a reminder that the sea is unforgiving even without an enemy. Across the war, well over 2,400 Hellcats were lost to all causes. With roughly 1,300 destroyed in training and ferry operations outside combat zones, a grim ledger that anchors any talk of superiority in the reality of risk and sacrifice, even with an airplane known for forgiving deck manners and sturdy landing gear. The Hellcat was arguably the most survivable and most forgiving carrier fighter of its era, but it was not immune to the hazards of night recoveries, bad weather, and long overwater patrols where a single engine cough could mean a cold ditching miles from help or kilometers from rescue. The U.S. Navy's growing mastery of radar control intersects with the Hellcat story in ways that most viewers never see. Shipboard fighters were vectored many miles or many kilometers ahead of the fleet to break up attacks, and the Hellcat's stability as a firing platform meant that when a controller set a pilot on a collision course with an incoming bomber, the intercept would more often end in a kill than a miss. As the campaign crossed the Central Pacific and moved into the Philippine Sea, this command and control edge compounded every hour the fleet operated while the Japanese pilot pipeline thinned, a tragic asymmetry that magnified every performance advantage the Hellcat held at moderate to high speeds. This became the hidden reason the Hellcat statistics grew so lopsided in 1944. The airplane, the radar, and the training locked together into a single lethal system. Japan's answer was not silence. It was the Kawanishi N1K Shiden and Shiden Kai, the Violet Lightning Line, which introduced a startling secret of its own. Automatic combat flaps, controlled by a mercury switch tied to G-load and airspeed that deployed in hard turns to produce extra lift and tighten the circle, a brilliant trick that allowed the Shiden Kai to dance with the best allied fighters at lower altitudes. Pilots on both sides respected the Shiden Kai's heavy armament and turning performance, and when flown by skilled hands, it could embarrass a Hellcat in a close-in fight, especially down low over Taiwan, the Philippines, Okinawa, and the home islands. But the Type's Homare engine suffered reliability issues and altitude performance limits that proved deadly against high-flying B-29 superfortresses, and production struggles meant too few reached the front to change the war's arc. The Shiden Kai was a superb late-war challenger with a secret flap advantage, but it arrived late in limited numbers and could not erase the growing U.S. edge in pilots, planes, and controllers. Meanwhile, the Hellcat continued to scale across the fleet, and its true greatness emerged not in a single duel, but in the massive arithmetic of sorties. Roughly 66,530 combat sorties across two years, with Hellcats credited by U.S. Navy and Marine sources with a majority share of American naval air victories and a claim 19 to 1 victory ratio that, even discounted, demonstrates an overwhelming operational advantage. Among the most measured accounts, museum and service histories emphasize the Hellcat's role in cleansing the skies over invasion beaches, escorting bombers, sweeping enemy airfields, and unleashing tens of thousands of rockets on ground targets, a multi-mission record that matters more than any single statistic because it describes control of the battle space day after day. This is the less visible truth. The Hellcat was designed not just to win dogfights, but to win campaigns. Let us step back to the terror of night again, because the Pacific after dusk held special danger. Torpedo runs in black water, sudden radar blips turning into engine notes out of the darkness, and the loss of leaders like Butch O'Hare during those first cooperative radar fighter tests from Enterprise. The night fighter Hellcat variants fitted with radar of their own would later grow into a reliable shield. But that early Bat Team mission on Thursday, November 26, 1943, remains a haunting hinge between guesswork and doctrine, a moment when a deadly experiment seeded a new norm that saved lives later. You can hear the mystery in it still. 
How could a daylight ace vanish on a night when the tactic itself was the true weapon? And how many later sailors lived because that secret was wrestled into practice? As a machine, the Hellcat was not the fastest fighter of World War II, nor the most glamorous, but it was arguably the most important carrier fighter of its time because it delivered the most decisive results in the theater that mattered most to the U.S. Navy, with the most consistency and the most forgiving flight behavior under combat pressure. Its top speed territory, high 300s in miles per hour, low to mid 600s in kilometers per hour, was enough. But its deck manners, resilience, and easy maintenance were the best. The very traits that let squadrons generate sorties every day and trap aboard safely every evening, even in heavy seas. Superior is not only about the fastest line on a chart, it is about the best fit to the job, and the Hellcat fit its job better than any other naval fighter of its era. The Zero that once ruled the early war had not grown much faster by 1944, with test figures for later A6M-5 models still in the mid-300 mph range at altitude, and its structural vulnerabilities, especially lack of self-sealing fuel tanks, remained a deadly flaw once Allied pilots learned to avoid slow, flat turns and instead used dives and slashing passes guided by controllers. The Hellcat's roll authority at high speed and its ability to absorb hits rewrote the exchange. Cannon bursts that might have shredded a pre-war light fighter were now more often survivable, and the American pilot who lived to fight another day was the quiet statistic that corroded Japan's air arm from 1943 onward. This is the hidden reason mission counts matter more than top speed. The airplane that brings its pilot home wins the long war. During the island hopping campaigns, Hellcats flew fighter sweeps ahead of amphibious landings, then circled as combat air patrol while others strafed and rocketed ground targets, unleashing an enormous quantity of ordnance, tens of thousands of rockets, and thousands of tons of bombs measured as many thousand short tons or many thousand metric tons across the theater from 1943 through 1945. The design strength meant that airfields pockmarked with debris and deck centers slammed by crosswinds were survivable environments rather than fatal traps, a quality every deck crew and pilot valued more than a few more miles per hour on a data sheet. For squadrons like those documented in U.S. Navy Museum records, sortie counts and flight hour totals testify to an airplane that simply worked day after day, ship after ship. Production tells another decisive truth. Grumman built more than 12,275 Hellcats in just over two years, an astonishing rate that at its peak pushed one airplane off the line roughly every hour, night and day, ensuring that fleet carriers and light carriers could recover from attrition and sustain pressure across an ocean measured in thousands of miles or thousands of kilometers. Japan's late war fighters like the Kawanishi Shidenkai could not be built in comparable numbers, and their Homare engines struggled with reliability, especially at altitude where the strategic battle against B-29s took place far above 21,000 feet or above 6,400 meters, a ceiling where the promise of George faded under thin air and mechanical limits. Industrial momentum is a weapon, and the Hellcat was the visible wing of that invisible arsenal. Even in measured evaluations against captured Japanese aircraft, Results underscored the Hellcat's strengths, faster at most altitudes, rolling better at higher speeds, able to climb competitively above mid-altitudes, and most importantly, able to absorb damage while bringing its pilot home to fight again. The Zero still turned tighter at low speed, but by 1943, American pilots were no longer trapped in that fight, now armed with the thatch weave, energy tactics, and the discipline of controller-driven intercepts that favored speed retention and slashing attacks. This doctrinal shift was the quiet secret that the Hellcat amplified, converting tactical lessons into strategic outcomes. In the end, the Hellcat's legacy was brief in frontline American service after 1945 as the jet age arrived. Though radar-equipped night fighters lingered into the early 1950s, and a handful of survivors still fly today as living steel reminders of a time when a strong, steady, and forgiving carrier fighter proved to be the most decisive weapon in the Pacific sky. It was not the flashiest nor the absolute fastest, but it was the most reliable partner a naval aviator could ask for in the darkest hours of World War II. Built to take punch, built to strike back, and built to come home, 